everybody. Welcome to EPA's Indoor Environments webinar, IAQ in Michigan Schools, Improving Indoor Air Quality to Respond to COVID and Beyond. I'm Melissa Halting. I'm with US EPA Region 5. It's EPA's regional office in Chicago. I lead the clean air strategy section and clean air, of course, includes indoor air. I'm super happy that you're here. This is EPA's first indoor environments webinar focused on the needs and resources of a specific state. And I'm so happy it's a state in our region, Michigan. Uh, EPA headquarters and regional staff planned this session alongside experts in Michigan, including representatives from Michigan, Michigan's governmental agencies, school districts, and non-governmental organizations. Um, I'm going to get into the goals for the session in just a moment, but first I want to point out that my indoor air quality team here in Chicago, which includes Jeanette Marrero, who will be speaking late, later in the webinar, Sheila Batka, and Monica Pagia, they are a resource for you in addition to other things we cover today. Uh, my experience team has been supporting Michigan partners to address school indoor air quality concerns since the 90s, shortly after our indoor air quality tools for schools program was launched. So we have very deep experience here in the regional office. We've conducted non-regulatory indoor air quality school assessments and have helped schools identify key indoor air quality elements in their sustainability, health, safety, and facility management plans. And in fact, we just returned from Michigan last week. We were in Flint where we did IAQ assessments in three of the schools in Flint with Pete Medor, who will also be speaking later. So I just want to point out we have great folks here and we want to be able to help you. One way that you can get in touch with us is filling out the evaluation questions at the end. That's where you're able to tell us where you are with regards to IAQ management and if you're interested in our help. And in addition, our contact information will be included in a follow-up material sent after the webinar. So let's get into the objectives. So during the next hour and a half, we're going to cover these objectives. First, how to develop a game plan to improve IAQ in your school or district, to reduce virus transmission, create healthy learning environments, and as an important co-benefit, optimizing energy performance. We're going to point you to some Michigan specific and federal resources like funding and assistance to help you make these improvements to your buildings and ventilation systems. And finally, the best way to learn is to learn from others successes and lessons learned. So our speakers will be sharing best practices used by school districts in Michigan, including knowing when it's best to get consultant help to perform assessments commissioning and retro commissioning. So now we will be talking about our amazing um, set of speakers. So I'm leading off. I will be joined shortly by my co-facilitator, Tracy Washington Enger. She is on the indoor environments team at headqu EPA at headquarters and leads the school's work. And like I said, Jeanette of my team will be speaking later. We are so pleased to have this amazing crew of folks who are willing to share their time and perspectives with us today. I'm not going to read all these names now, but I will introduce them as they speak. So next, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy. He's going to give an overview of some of the federal resources and information available. Tracy, over to you. Terrific, Melissa, thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to share um, with this audience some of the national resources that we have, but also, you know, so I'm Tracy Washington Inger. I'm with the Indoor Environments Division at headquarters at EPA. And I've been at this work for, you know, nearly 30 years. Um, and, you know, certainly since we, you know, started the Tools for Schools program. And this particular webinar that is really focused on um, advancing and accelerating the, the efforts within a particular state is something that we have always, you know, been focused on trying to do more. And we in Michigan and Region 5 
with the partnerships that you have and the strengths of assets, it is just a really exciting time for us to be um, engaging and partnering in this way because, you know, all of us, those of us who work in, uh, with, and for our schools, we know that they do much more than just deliver, you know, an adequate curriculum for education. We know that where students learn is just as important as what they learn. And a healthy indoor learning environment is really supported by this three-legged stool that you see here of occupant health, student performance, and a well-managed physical environment. All of that is essential to schools for them to achieve their primary academic missions. And so our schools, you know, we know over time, our schools have really become a social safety net for our communities and providing everything from meals to real to, to primary health care when we see you know the school-based health centers so for many students we know that their school is going to be the cleanest healthiest safest place in their lives really and covid has been really a stark reminder to us of the importance of understanding the connection between the physical environment health and academic performance in our schools. So, you know, even before COVID, students and staff were missing school due to any number of health impacts associated with poor indoor air quality. But especially, you know, we, when we look at something like asthma, you know, which has is impacted directly by indoor air quality, it's the leading cause of school absenteeism um, due to a chronic condition. And it accounts for more than yeah, 10 million school, in missed school days a year. And when kids are missing that 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 learning, that is not something that they are going to recoup. And so, for us, um, it is really important um, to have resources in place to to address that. So at EPA, we do have a wide range of resources to help schools implement comprehensive IAQ management plans that create safer um, learning environments with using proactive measures while balancing energy efficiency. So the IAQ Tools for Schools Action Kit, which you'll hear a lot more about from our, from our speakers, was designed to help schools acquire the skills needed to really identify, um, assess, and address, and prevent the environmental health issues that negatively impact teaching and learning by implementing comprehensive IAQ management plans. And the kit was designed with all kinds of checklists and supporting materials to address the IAQ issues that we find across the, across the nation in all of our schools. And then for long-term planning and sustained success, we have the, we, uh, we, we know that preventive maintenance is essential, taking proactive measures. So the indoor air quality tools for schools preventive maintenance guidance provides customizable Excel spreadsheets and checklists for all of the technical solutions that we provide, including HVAC, source control, cleaning and maintenance, along with inventory sheets, model programs, just everything that you need really to operationalize the recommended activities for really ongoing support throughout the academic year. But we also know it's important to be addressing energy efficiency as well and how we are how we're managing energy expenditures in our schools too so the energy savings plus guide, plus health guidance document um, is uh, with this uh, checklist and customizable checklist generator is really a step-by-step -step guide um, to repairing and renovating your schools in a way that protects and improves IAQ while maximizing energy efficiency and minimizing costs as well so all of these are underpinned by our Tools for Schools framework for effective IAQ school management. And that is six key drivers and successful strategies for continuous improvement. So this framework is especially useful as we are to help you organize and operationalize all of the different guidance that is coming from various sources right now, especially as it relates to COVID. So this flexible framework can be applied to help you take action on the guidance. Um, and you'll be hearing a lot about the strategies under the assess driver today to help you develop effective and sustainable IAQ plans for your schools. In addition to the, the key drivers, um, the, the kit also offers seven technical solutions. And these are the IAQ issues that the kit and framework are can be used to address in order to achieve reliable, clean, efficient, and healthy um, school uh, environments in your schools. So this webinar, we're going to take a really deep dive into quality HVAC technical solutions. Um, but you'll also hear from our speakers the importance of, you know, in addition to you know, to optimizing ventilation practices, um, uh, but all, all of the technical solutions working together concurrently. So, you know, 
especially during um, this, you know, in response to, to COVID, knowing which interventions work best has become even more critical for school districts to capitalize on the increased funding resources that have become available to schools from, uh, for COVID response to implement building upgrades, um, to assess your school facilities, and to institutionalize really the most effective IAQ practices. So the COVID pandemic has been a catalyst for the Department of Ed to direct unprecedented levels of funding towards addressing school facilities. And I'm sure that some of you have already seen that coming into your school districts. So the American Rescue Plan provided um, $81 billion to state educational facilities to address um, 18 areas of activities, including really for the first time that we've seen five IAQ related activities and infrastructure improvements. And so this is really a, a, a great opportunity for us to capitalize um, on, on, uh, on these funds as we create, um, as we address building performance and results for, uh, for our building occupants. So, in, you know, so we at EPA, you know, looking at um, COVID specifically, so when responding to COVID specifically, school districts have really relied very heavily on the guidance um, for health and the environment and um, from building sciences and experts at, at places like ASHRAE and CDC. And most of that guidance really hinges on proven, uh, on three proven approaches for that are increasing ventilation rates, enhanced filtration and supplemental um, ventilation with portable air cleaners when needed. So at EPA, we developed this technical guidance um, infographic to help schools operationalize that guidance by um, providing simple strategies to kind of jumpstart your IAQ programs um, and address issues quickly and respond to them, no matter kind of how simple or how complicated they may be. But we know that those are just the beginning and that the data that you collect during your assessments is valuable for creating a plan to prioritize action um, and really applying the technical solutions. So, you know, when we look at it, we recognize the, the, the importance of preventive maintenance as well for addressing deferred issues, as well as energy efficiency and energy management being one of the most lucrative places where um, addressing IAQ and deferred maintenance can really pay off. So preventive maintenance has a tremendous range of benefits and our focus really is on that dynamic interconnection of indoor air quality, preventive maintenance, and energy efficiency. Because one of the things that we know is that, you know, they're you know, making that connection between um, health quality HVAC and energy efficiency, those technical solutions is how we begin to kind of debunk this false dichotomy between energy efficiency and good indoor air quality. They really are two sides of the same coin, and that coin is creating healthy school environments. So we're gonna be talking, you're gonna be hearing our speakers talk a lot about, you know, how you really put in place the strategies associated with the assessed driver, key driver, and it's also how you can validate your program efforts um, and where you conduct one of the most important actions for your IAQ management plan, which is the tools for, the, which is the school assessment walkthrough. And during these walkthroughs, you, you can collect data and identify needs and really prioritize your program. Um, and you're also kind of being assessed by your, by your occupants while you're doing it as well. So it's a great opportunity to hear directly from your occupants um, and to support them, uh, to support them and build your program. So that's just, you know, a beginning to, to give you an idea of, of what we at the national level have provided and what is being tailored specifically by your regional, by your region five staff um, as they interact with school districts directly in Michigan, who you're going to be hearing from and how they are applying all of these key drivers, addressing these technical solutions and getting and getting great results. So it is my pleasure to be with you here today. I will see you again on the other end at the Q&A. Um, and in the meantime, at, put your questions into the into the chat function, and we'll be excited to respond to them um, at, the, at the at the end of the webinar. Um, but thank you so much, um, Melissa. I'll turn it back over to you. All right. So we will now get into it, and I'm going to transition now to our first speaker, Evelia Jankowski. She is the state school nurse consultant for both the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and the Michigan Department of Education. Hello, my name is Evelia Jankowski. 
I am the state school nurse consultant for Michigan. I spent the last 30 years of my 42 year nursing career as a school nurse. You may wonder how school nurses fit into this important topic. The National Association of School Nurses framework for the 21st century school nurse practice provides a graphic illustration of the key principles of professional school nursing practice. The framework provides guidance for the practicing school nurse to reach the goal of supporting student health and academic success by contributing to a healthy and safe school environment. You can see the student is at the center of our model. Our goal is for that student to be healthy, safe, and ready to learn. Family and school community surrounding the student influence the student's ability for academic success. Surrounding the family, and the student and the school community are overlapping key principles of care coordination, leadership, quality improvement, community and public health. These principles are guided by the fifth principle overarching, which is the foundational for evidence-based clinically competent quality care, the standards of practice. School nurses use the skills outlined in each of these principles to help students to be healthy, safe, and ready to learn throughout their workday. The standard of practice that reflects best practice when we are supporting students with asthma comes from a variety of professional resources. The EPR3 or expert panel review updates that were released last year promote more attention than ever at addressing asthma triggers in the environments where individuals with asthma live, work, and learn. The SAMPRO or school Asthma Allergy and Anaphylaxis Management Program also calls for addressing asthma triggers. Michigan Department of Education has taken the cue from these evidence-based resources to update the model policy for supporting students with asthma to include more attention to mitigating asthma triggers. In fact, the school nurses standards of care for supporting students with asthma in Michigan closely follow the MDE policy and will promote a more concerted effort to addressing asthma triggers. To improve health and academic outcomes for students with asthma, they must first be identified. In Michigan, we generally see three students with asthma in a class of 30. Once we know who the students are with asthma and what their triggers are, we can begin to identify which of those triggers are present in the school environment or even on the way to school. Outdoor as well as indoor air quality can have a huge impact on asthma symptoms. School nurses provide care coordination for students with health needs in school. Care coordination interventions for students with asthma include decreasing opportunities for exposure to triggers by actually mitigating those triggers. This means that the school nurse often provides leadership as they are the change agents who brings school colleagues together from the administration to teachers to custodial staff to identify strategies and resources to mitigate triggers. COVID has actually been quite helpful in help making everyone aware of the need for good air quality. This framework supports the school nurse to lead or join in the efforts to address environmental health efforts like integrated pest management, promoting electric school buses, and no idling policies. There are many asthma triggers that affect the environmental health and air quality in our schools. Triggers like exposure to colds and flu virus, dust mites, second and third hand smoke, and vehicle emissions can become barriers for students with asthma to be healthy in school and ready to learn. The good news is that now more than ever, we have low or no cost solutions to address environmental asthma triggers in schools, such as outlined in the EPR3 updates, SAMPRO, and our MDE model policy. Thank you. All right, next up we have Tim Pereno, a board member of the Michigan School Business Officials, or MISBO, and the Director of Facilities for Kent Intermediate School District. Tim. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as was mentioned, I am Director of Facilities at Kent Intermediate School District uh, here in Grand Rapids. Kent ISD happens to be the fourth largest ISD in the state of Michigan. We serve over 100,000 students. 
and I'm actively involved with districts all around the county, both public and private, and have uh, been dealing with indoor air quality issues with them for quite some time. Also, as a board member for the Michigan School Business Officials, or MSBO, uh, I've been involved in school facility committees at a statewide level uh, for over 25 years. So very involved in this issue. And I think it's important to note that indoor air quality has been an important issue for schools for quite some time. We've routinely monitored uh, indoor spaces to ensure proper ventilation and address occupant concerns. In many cases, this involves verifying that the proper preventative maintenance has taken place on air handling equipment, that filters were replaced on a regular schedule, and that contaminants did not exist within the space. Routine air monitoring, reduced use of products that contain high levels of volatile organic compounds or VOCs, and an emphasis on cleaning and sanitation were all commonplace and continue to be so. It was with the onset of the COVID pan pandemic, however, that the importance of, of IAQ and the proper functioning of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning equipment has been elevated to a much higher level of concern. As more and more evidence pointed to the airborne nature of the virus, school districts throughout the state shifted their operating protocols and focused their attention on how to best mitigate the transmission of the virus. MSBO began offering virtual town hall meetings shortly after the onset of the pandemic when schools were shut down and have continued holding these town halls up to this day. The discussion topics in these meetings were varied at the beginning of the pandemic for sure and dealt with things like cleaning and and information that we really didn't know uh, good details on. But over the course of the last 18 months to two years, have been much more focused on a IAQ issues and strategies that schools can implement to protect students and staff. School personnel, especially those in facilities and operations, have been inundated with recommendations about operational protocols, new technologies, new products, and enhanced monitoring services. The struggle for these folks is to be able to evaluate the efficacy of these recommendations and make informed decisions that will not only positively impact the health of the students and staff in their district, but will be operationally and fiscally sustainable. And I think that is a very important message is that there is just a lot of information for folks to take in and to understand what is viable and what is not. Now more than ever, there's also an increased scrutiny from not just the staff and students within the buildings, but also from parents and community members. And so there is a greater emphasis on districts implementing best practices and operational strategies that improve indoor air quality and then reduce health risk to, to all occupants. It is also important to note that most districts throughout the state are receiving these, uh, you know, the emergency relief funds, as was mentioned earlier. And with the influx of this money, it's critical they understand how best to utilize these funds to make the biggest impact on the health and safety of staff and students and on indoor air quality. They need to be informed consumers, and it is imperative that in districts understand how new technologies work and how new products operate and which ones are best for them in their given situation. They need to understand how these new approaches will provide the biggest impact to their district. MSBO as an organization really has taken the lead in providing trainings in the form of webinars, conference sessions, and virtual town hall meetings, as I mentioned before, uh, surrounding these issues, indoor air quality and COVID response planning. Uh, sessions such as this one are, are especially critical for school personnel who are attempting to stay up on the most current information, um, especially as they plan for future facility improvements, and that is happening uh, quite frequently across the state. So I'm looking forward to information being shared in today's webinar um, because of its critical importance. MSBO as an organization will continue to serve as a resource for these issues, so please look for opportunities and information coming out in the near future. Thank you very much. All right, next up we have Regina Strong. She is the environmental justice public advocate for the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Hi, Regina, take it away. 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, I really wanted to share kind of the genesis of a Michigan program that I'm hopeful many of you are um, familiar with already. So my office, the Office of the Environmental Justice Public Advocate, was created in 2019 um, by Governor Whitmer to really focus on what many communities faced across the state. Um, in addition, there was an interagency environmental justice team that was formed at the same time to really bring all state departments to the table to really have discussions about the ways to address environmental justice across the state. One of the uh, areas of the work of the response team was to create work groups to really focus on different areas. And ultimately, we also created from our office, the Michigan Advisory Council for Environmental Justice, or the MACDJ, as I like to call it, um, which began meeting in February of 2020. And to date has only had one in-person meeting given um, the COVID reality that we live in right now. And so the goal of the office is really to engage with communities across the state. And one of the things that um, has been challenging for communities, particularly those who, you know, live in areas with um, potential impact from industrial sites and other things that impact air quality, um, was the concern about schools in close proximity um, to those sites. And so pre um, pandemic and pre our concerns around COVID-19, there was really a desire to address those um, schools and the air quality in those schools. Um, my office sits in the Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. And so in the work combined with the rest of that department, really looking for ways to help address that. So one of the things that came through loud and clear from the advocates and others who are part of our Environmental Justice Advisory Council um, was the concern around indoor air quality in schools. And you've heard, you know, from the two previous speakers about just concerns around asthma and other things that impact the respiratory health of students um, external to the school and internal to the school. And so really thinking about how do we address that? So the initial genesis of um, looking at ways to support um, HVAC assessments in schools really came from that desire to address asthma and other issues that could impact schools in certain communities. Once the pandemic took hold, it was really evident that communities, um, in particular environmental justice communities, often lower income communities, were particularly hard hit by the pandemic in the early stages. And our advisory council really wanted us to look at a way to address that. So the beginnings of the program to assess HVAC systems in schools was very focused on looking at um, that air quality in schools in EJ communities. However, as the pandemic continued, what we realized is that all schools across the state really needed the opportunity to assess their systems to see how they could be more protected. And so one of the things that you know we did early on in looking um, opportunities for air quality has worked with the energy office within um, Eagle to see if there was funding to support that effort. So you all may have seen if you work with schools in the state, um, a call for survey information and opportunities to apply. Um, pretty much last year was when that came out in 2021. Um, that program continues, although the survey has not. Um, um, the need for the survey, really it is an application now to apply. And the good news is we have funding to support these assessments in any school across the state. So every school is eligible. And we really want to help use this as the starting place of moving forward with addressing indoor air quality in schools. And so this remains available to all school districts across the state. One of the things that I think is critical to that and both a challenge and I guess an opportunity moving forward is in this work, there is a challenge of finding contractors, um, not just for this work, but for other work. And so it has been slower than we anticipated, but there are still opportunities to have systems assessed. So I wanna 
you know, assure you that if your school district applies to have buildings assessed, we will definitely get you in the queue and support the costs of having that assessment done. And so um, really, uh, you know, this slide just echoes what I just said, that funding is available. Um, also looking at through the assessment, how to make recommendations for improvements so that then you can take that to the next level and use that assessment in concert with what the EPA IAQ office can do and other folks in the state. So just wanted to make sure I share that. Um, I will be around during the question, but wanted to make sure I share both the genesis of the program and that that program can be a first step in assessing what comes next in your work for improving air quality within your school. Thank you. Oh, just wanted to mention, this has been a partnership across many departments in the state, as I talked about, as well as external partners to really, um, you know, move this forward, support um, the costs of an assessment and take things to the next level in terms of right. air quality for students. Now I'm done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Regina. Thank you. All right. And next up, we have Sonia Ponce. She is the chair of the ASHRAE Detroit Chapter COVID-19 Task Force and founder of Building Vitals, as well as Dr. Stuart Batterman, a professor of environmental health sciences at the University of Michigan, and also a professor of civil environmental engineering at the University of Michigan. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to start off and I hope you can hear me. Um, so uh, this afternoon, Sonia and I are going to um, give you a fire hose here of information, just um, a lot of information dealing with um, transitioning from assessment to planning, actually improving ventilation, filtration, and indoor air cleaning. <clears throat> so there are many different types of schools. These are examples of uh, schools in uh, different portions of the Midwest primarily. Um, some schools have uh, conventional energy systems. There are Energy Star, LEED certified buildings on uh, other types of cases. Um, one of the take homes is that every school is unique, but throughout the schools, indoor air quality is critical for health, comfort, learning, for minimizing the COVID risk. The ventilation, filtration, air cleaning systems can reduce exposure and disease transmission. Regardless of the type of school, there are solutions that are available, but you just can't dump them in. They have to be considered as part of a building system. And then finally, maintenance and operation, as we'll talk later in the presentation, are very key components. So what do we know about indoor air quality in the SARS-CoV-2 virus? First of all, it's clear now that transmission of the virus mostly occurs through inhalation of virus-laden aerosols. Aerosols I'll discuss are smaller droplets or smaller particles that are emitted while talking, exhaling, singing, sneezing, coughing, and so forth. Once airborne, the virus can remain infective and viable for hours. A review of about three or 400 outbreaks showed that every one or nearly every one occurred in indoor environments. So the indoor environment is the key place where this occurs. And the risk, the viral concentration, the viral load and uptake depends on many factors that are listed in the slide, but it's clear that ventilation, filtration, and air cleaning can improve things. So what's the situation in schools, in Michigan schools and other schools? Um, Quickly, we have high occupant densities. We have issues with uh, ventilation and air change rates tend to be low. Filtration efficiency is generally pretty minimal. There are significant concerns regarding the design, the maintenance, and the operation of mechanical systems. Rarely do we see supplemental air cleaning used. And children are a vulnerable population, and they spend 1,300 or so hours per year in schools. It's the most important environment after the home for them. And of course, it's tough to get kids vaccinated and to ensure that masks are worn. So taking all these things together, next slide, we have the perfect storm. All right, let's move on. 
Now, I don't want to spend too much time because our time is limited here, but this picture on the right shows uh, human hair. Uh, the little blue dots are called PM10. These are uh, 10 microns in diameter. The little pink dots on the blue are called PM2.5. This is uh, particulate matter under two and a half microns, something regulated by US EPA and outdoor air. Just to give you a sense of the microscopic nature of these PM2.5 particles. For COVID, what we're most concerned with are respiral aerosols. These are typically under five microns. So they're kind of a little bigger than the PM2.5. Um, but these can all be important and you should recognize that the size of these aerosols varies considerably. So the size matters. It matters because it uh, primarily affects the longevity of the aerosol in the air. Aerosols, just a few microns or smaller, will essentially stay airborne until they're removed by a filter or deposited somewhere. They won't fall out of the ground. On the other hand, larger um, aerosols called droplets, typically over 50 microns in diameter, will fall out uh, within just a meter or so. So the picture at the right shows the infected individual in red. They might sneeze. They uh, micrograph the picture in black and white to the bottom, shows a sneeze where the larger particles are dropping out of the air within just a few feet, while the smaller aerosols, the respirable ones, just a couple microns in diameter, can drift seven, eight meters or longer and stay airborne. And so what we can do is to understand the importance of the aerosol size in aerosol transmission and the COVID risk. Also, aerosol size really matters because the ability of a filter to remove the particle is a very strong function of aerosol size, and um, only the better filters will get these smaller particles. So we had some uh, overviews uh, uh, of the importance of indoor air quality on health, comfort, and learning on, in schools, and I don't want to repeat what was gone, uh, what was transpired earlier in the webinar, but we know that indoor air quality is among the top environmental risks to public health, and it has both short and long-term effects, including uh, asthma, as was mentioned earlier. And these problems can affect uh, learning and comfort and performance in schools. And in the last five or so years, there have been a number of very interesting and informative studies showing how both student and teacher performance is uh, uh, deteriorates when comfort and air quality is not optimal in schools. So EPA likes to stress um, how important the indoor environment is with regard to safety and stewardship um, for students and staff and also for facilities. So, it's been interesting for me working uh, for a number of decades in the air quality and perhaps about 20 years ago we started recognizing that indoor air quality is really very important, uh, potentially more important than outdoor air for a number of good reasons. Uh, first, uh, we spend uh, most of our time indoors, indoor air concentrations are often higher than outdoor levels. Uh, things have not gotten better with energy conservation measures necessarily, uh, which limit dilution. And there are many sources of pollutants, both indoors and outdoors. And finally, indoors, we actually can uh, sequester some of these pollutants and increase their lifetime. And this can lead to higher concentrations and exposures. So there are a variety of indoor air pollutants of concern. Uh, earlier, we talked about asthma and largely uh, particulate matter is associated with asthma exacerbations. And of course, uh, aerosols uh, are a form of particulate matter and can transfer the COVID virus. So let's talk about some of the solutions. First, ventilation. Broadly, ventilation with outdoor air removes moisture pollutants and the virus that are emitted from indoor sources. Essentially, we're diluting emissions from a super spreader or somebody who is emitting COVID. We need high enough ventilation rates so that we do not compromise indoor air quality and cause odors and discomfort and absenteeism and so forth. Now, ASHRAE, the code setting organization, sets minimum ventilation rates in model codes and standards, which 
a new building needs to comply with. The general guidance is that personal ventilation rates should be at a minimum something on the order of about 15 cubic feet per minute per person. In the pandemic, ASHRAE came out with additional guidance, as did other organizations. The guidance is to provide the lowest possible particulate concentrations to fully open outside air dampers and to achieve a minimum air change rate of three air changes of outside air per hour. And on top of this, used enhanced filtration or air cleaners to basically double the air change rate effectively to get a total of four to six air changes per hour of outdoor plus filtered air. Now this applies to each classroom or other zone in the space. So the color graphic on the bottom left shows a kind of color scale where we want at least four or five air changes per hour, ideally we'd like 10. And ASHRAE's standard is 62.1 shown at the bottom right. So just to make sure everybody's on the same page with respect to terminology for ventilation, um, I have here a schematic of a space showing you the major air flows. What we're talking about with natural ventilation is opening windows and so forth to allow flows we also have infiltration, exfiltration through cracks and crevices in the building. What's not well recognized is that simply opening a window on a day like today where it's very comfortable outside doesn't really provide a lot of additional ventilation because natural ventilation depends on the temperature difference in the wind speed and you need large temperature difference and a wind speed to actually drive that air. Most of our schools and most of our larger buildings are mechanically ventilated. They have a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. This provides that outside air, and the uh, flows are shown on the diagram. Um, and uh, most systems recirculate air so that they don't have to heat and cool as much air, providing mixing in the space, but not a new supply of outside air if the dampers are closed. In both cases, we provide ventilation through transfer between building spaces and infiltration, exfiltration, as I mentioned. Now, the guidance that I just provided from ASHRAE and others suggests that in the space, we want to have three to six air changes per hour. This means that in each classroom or each zone, you're essentially going to replace or filter all that air every 10 or 20 minutes. There's additional ways to use ventilation to improve um, the air quality, reduce COVID and so forth. Um, there are flushing procedures where uh, the space can be unoccupied and the space is flushed by uh, changing the air quite rapidly. I don't see a lot of schools do this, but there are a number of good applications, both after the school day, between classroom activities, and as a pre-purge, uh, in particular before morning traffic peak, which might bring in pollutants, you can pre-purge before that and condition the space. So what's the status of ventilation rates in schools in Michigan and the Midwest? We did a study, um, looked at about 40 different schools, a bunch of classrooms in each one. The condition that we found was not great. This was done prior to COVID about five years ago. But in new schools, less than 10 years old, or newly renovated, fully renovated schools, the air change rates average just under two air changes per hour. We want three. Only 15% made, made it to three. You can use CO2 as an indicator, easy to measure, of ventilation rates. We have several papers that describe how to do that effectively. On top of this, we found that HVAC systems, mechanical systems were often shut off at the end of the school day, even though cleaning and other activities were still going on and folks were still working and sometimes kids were still present. We found a number of schools where the outside air dampeners were permanently shut. We found particular problems in smaller schools and classrooms using, using unit ventilators and some simpler non-centralized mechanical systems. This was the status in newer buildings. When we're looking at older buildings, you know, 20 to 50 to 60 years old, we find much lower ventilation rates, particularly in those schools using radiators and natural ventilation. 
and we often find problems in portables and modular classrooms. The only thing unique probably in Michigan, I would say, is that we have a lot of older schools and we have both a significant heating and cooling uh, cycle. So we're using a lot of mechanical systems typically or heating and um, uh, cooling quite frequently. There's considerable opportunity to increase ventilation rates with only small energy penalties. My last topic uh, before I turn it over to Sonia is talk about filters. On the right, we see a typical sort of fibrous filter. These can remove dust, particles, pollen, virus, and so forth. So a mechanical system, uh, as I'm showing here, has opportunities to have filters in several places. You can have outside air filters in uh, treating simply the outside air or the combination of outside air plus return air. Next slide. We also have a mixing box typically doing recirculation. You can have a filter there. Next slide. And then finally, adding a personal or a portable air cleaner or room air filter can condition the air in that space. To have effective filtration, you have to consider this as a system. You need a good enough filter with a high enough filter efficiency for those small particles. You need a high enough flow rate. You have to operate the system, so you need enough runtime. You have to maintain your filter and have change out. The filter has to be installed without uh, errors, without bypass. And you need to consider the configuration of the air mixing in the space and the sources within. So really, I'm again emphasizing the importance of considering the overall system. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the different types of filters that are available. On the left, we have a standalone portable air filter. Um, we have uh, pleated extended depth filters, uh, secondary or bag filters. The combination of those extended area and secondary bag filters providing mechanical air uh, filtration is really the preferred approach. Uh, on the right, we have uh, some low cost uh, fiberglass types of filters, rarely seen in schools, although I have seen some that are furnace filters, which basically will collect leaves and, and uh, some dust, but it won't do anything for PM 2.5. So filter efficiency is rated uh, using several different systems. Probably uh, the most common system is the minimum efficiency reporting value system, the MERV ratings. Um, this is embodied in an ASHRAE code. I want to point out that when you get to smaller particles around the size of 0.5 to 1, you can see how the filter efficiency drops in the case of all of these different lines here. These are the sizes of and particles that are very important for PM 2.5 as well as for virus. Basically, a MERV filter under 11, 12, or 13 does very little for PM or 2.5 or for the virus. So we really recommend a minimum of 13 is a MERV rating to address PM 2.5 and the virus. So think, what are your schools equipped with? I also want to mention that for the most part, the extended area drop-in filters that are rated for MERV 11 and above are using electrostatic fibers, and the MERV rating does not account for their deterioration, which occurs quite rapidly as they lose their electrostatic charge. So we have a newer MERV system uh, called MERV A, and I really encourage you to get filters that are tested if you can, or at least demand this, because the filter manufacturers have not done this very much, get MERV A filters that meet your 13 requirement. For a portable air filter, you also need to consider the clean air delivery rate, and Sonia will talk a little bit more about that. Take home point here is a filter under 11, 12, or 13 is not gonna do much for you for a COVID or for PM 2.5. So what do we find in schools in the Midwest? We find a lot of dirty overloaded filters, a number of good reasons for not changing them out are listed here. We find lots of filters misinstalled, gaskets missing, this bypass quite common. We find both dirty filters plus bypass. 
And we typically find MERV ratings from seven to eight as the default. And then hardly any of the schools had institute tests that document performance of their air uh, filtration, much less the uh, HVAC system, despite the existence of the standard for doing so. So I think there are many opportunities to upgrade filters in schools. All right, my last slide here is, do we know if filters work? One of the issues with COVID is it's very difficult to measure the virus in real time in ambient air or indoor air. What I'm gonna present here is a simul simulation of COVID from a super spreader who comes into a room at about eight o'clock, uh, sneezes or coughs twice, um, sneezes again, maybe an hour later. And this is a prediction of the airborne concentration that you get from this sneezer with the um, scenario releasing a thousand viral particles, just an arbitrary number. This is in a room with minimal filtration about the size of a classroom. If we put in a HEPA filter like the one that I showed you operating at about 300 CFM, change nothing else, let this super spreader cough twice, we have a reduction in the peak concentration by about two, doesn't sound like that much, but in terms of the integrated or the average concentration, it's fallen six times. And we can see that we've in fact captured about 85% of the viral particles that were emitted by the filter. So this is just a model, but it's a you know, physically based engineering type of model showing how with higher ventilation and higher filtration, we can actually greatly reduce the exposure to COVID. I'll pause here and let Sonia, take over. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stuart. Um, so Stuart was talking about um, filters and mechanical filters are um, just a real excellent strategy for providing or part of the strategy for providing good indoor air quality. But there are times like now when we want to do more, when we want to go beyond the ability of the typical mechanical filter. And so you may want to include um, an advanced air cleaning technology either inside your uh, major equipment, like your air handler or your ductwork, um, or standalone equipment inside specific rooms. You might look at incorporating something like ultraviolet dermicidal irradiation, uh, also known as UVGI or UVC or GUV or just UV. Um, UV radiation uh, is naturally occurring. It's about 10% of the sun's radiation falls into this category. Uh, we've known about the germicidal properties of uh, UV for nearly 150 years or so, and uh, since the early 1900s, we've been developing and using UV technology in various settings. So it's got a long-standing and well-documented track record of effectiveness against viruses and other microorganisms. Uh, essentially, it works by damaging uh, DNA and preventing cells from replicating. It's frequently used in hospitals, laboratories, clean rooms, municipal uh, water treatment facilities, and increasingly we are seeing it used in commercial applications like schools and large office buildings. Um, if you're interested in, in bringing a technology like this into your space, um, a couple of things to just be aware of. One, that um, UV can damage um, um, eyes and it can create sunburn. So you want to make sure that that staff who are um, tasked with maintaining this system um, are outfitted with proper PPE when they're uh, involved with it. Um, and one of the, the key things that you want to be aware of is that some of the newer um, UV technologies that you know we've been looking at energy efficiency. Um, for a number of years now. And so people have begun transitioning their lighting from older fluorescent technology to LED technology. They're looking at doing the same thing um, in, the, in the UV market. But um, just note that uh, UV systems using LED lighting um, rather than you know, mercury vapor or other noble gas lighting uh, may not be as efficient um, or as effective as you might think. Uh, the LED lighting is more efficient in terms of electricity consumption, but it is not as efficient um, at deactivating viruses. And so you just want to make sure that you're exercising due diligence uh, when you're bringing in this, uh, uh, this new technology, um, this recommended technology. So this next slide and the slide after it 
Um, so we can actually go ahead and advance two slides because I, I know I've got about five people behind me. So I'm going to try to um, pick up the pace a bit here. Um, but these next two slides, uh, they they address some of the emerging technologies in air cleaning. So the the the, the previous slide the talked about photocatalytic oxidizers. Those use uh, UV uh, light as well as a catalyst to act on water molecules uh, in the air, and they create um, radicals and superoxide ions, and they oxidize the VOCs and eliminate microorganisms. And the big advantage of, of that technology is that uh, the ions that are generated uh, travel with the air and more or less continue eliminating VOCs in the occupied space. Uh, the, 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 the ionizing air cleaners um, perform um, somewhat similarly. These are actually a, a derivative of older electrostatic air cleaners that you may be more familiar with. And uh, instead of um, charging small particles and having them agglomerate and then precipitate out on collection plates, these actually send those ions out into the airstream where similar to the, the photocatalytic oxidizers, uh, they interact with contaminants in the space. Um, so some of the things that you may want to certainly be aware of when you're introducing a new technology um, is you know, how this functions, what is its safety record, what is its performance record, things of that nature. Now, some of the, um, the, the photocatalytic oxidizers, they use um, UV, uh, a or UVB instead of UVC. Um, so they may not necessarily be as effective at uh, destroying um, pathogens. Um, and some of the test data for, for both of these technologies, the ionic air cleaners as well as the PCOs, a lot of these, um, the, 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 the effectiveness testing um, has not been consistent, meaning that some studies show that they're effective, some studies indicate that they're not effective. Um, and so that's just you know how things go again with with an emerging technology um, as manufacturers are, um, are are perfecting things. That's why in the next slide you can see that the CDC is really encouraging everyone to use due diligence when evaluating new technologies. This is very very important um, whether the technology is wholly new um, or when they're adaptations of older technologies, but you know they they have. Um, been used in one particular application, but they may not have been proven effective or safe in a new application. Um, for example, PCO often is combined with um, dry hydrogen peroxide. Uh, dry hydrogen peroxide is being used for medical instrumentation sterilization uh, for quite a while and uh, as an alternative to steam sterilization. It's known to be very effective at sterilizing instruments in an enclosure, under a vacuum, uh, with a small sealed air volume. But its effectiveness and safety moving around an occupied building hasn't been studied as much and is less understood. So we want to ask manufacturers and, and reps for, for data, um, as we can see on the next slide here, that substantiates their performance claims. Right? This data should be either independent third-party test data um, or it could be manufacturer in-house test data, but to an industry standard. Um, for established technologies, the test procedures are out there and you should fully expect that manufacturers are using them, and they are. Uh, but for newer technologies and emerging technologies, uh, the, all the test data may not be there. So in that case, you may ask manufacturers what tests are they using or what are they planning to use um, to substantiate their, um, their uh, performance of their equipment. Um, if the manufacturer doesn't have certified test data, then Perhaps ask for a witness test that reflects your specific application. Um, and be aware that new tests are coming out all the time. Just a couple of months ago here, IES and IUBA um, uh, introduced LM92-22 uh, to look at um, LEDs for ultraviolet um, applications. Um, the, the ASTM standard that's been around for a while that's specifically looking at, um, at UV applications for, for surface um, uh, cleaning and sterilization. Um, AHAM, uh, which looks at uh, the uh, in-room air cleaners, right? The, typically what you would see uh, in, in residential and small office applications. Uh, they just introduced a new standard that, that looks at measuring the rate at which um, air cleaners reduce um, bacteria uh, in the air, right, in space. So there are new standards coming out um, regularly 
um, not just because of COVID, but certainly more because of, of, of COVID um, that will help us to be able to look at equipment and evaluate uh, the operation of equipment and compare one manufacturer's equipment to another. Um, and even if that performance test data is a little fluid, the safety testing should not be. Right? Any equipment you bring into a school building should have appropriate safety certifications. Um, for example, some air cleaners have a known potential of creating ozone as a byproduct. Uh, we know that ozone is a pollutant, and so we would want to make sure in that case, if we were bringing in uh, in-room air cleaners, uh, that they have been tested and that they have a UL sticker for UL2998 um, certifying that they produce um, ozone below um, a, a, the threshold level of 0 0.005 parts per million. And we don't only want to ask questions of manufacturers. We want to also ask them of ourselves, right? We want to be honest with ourselves. Um, can we afford to buy new equipment? Uh, can we afford to operate and maintain and ultimately dispose of it? Um, do we have enough in-house staff? Does our staff new need new training? Um, is this in our budget? Uh, what's the total cost of ownership, right? These are very, very important questions. And then a, a very, very important question uh, is what do we do if this doesn't work out? You know, what's our exit strategy for, for, for this solution? Um, having the answers to the questions like these will help inform your decisions about adopting new technologies. Um, whether they're well-established uh, new technologies or just new to you, to your facility. And uh, we want to make sure that we read those, uh, the data that we get from manufacturers very carefully. Um, you know, people aren't necessarily intending to be misleading, but sometimes the way things get worded, uh, they can be misleading. So, for example, here we're looking at a, a, a statement from a manufacturer. Uh, this piece of equipment has a, a HEPA filter and it also has an optional um, ionization um, component to it. Um, and it says here that it's recommended, uh, that it's a recommended strategy. And actually, of the, it, it's got two pieces, it's got two technologies in there. And only one of those technologies is actually the recommended technology. So we want to make sure that we're understanding what we're looking at and reading the data that we get from manufacturers carefully and asking questions, asking probing questions. And um, I just kind of put this slide in here. I know that we haven't really talked about this much in, in this presentation. Stuart mentioned uh, relative humidity just very briefly here. Um, but I want to throw this in because a lot of times we overlook relative humidity. It's um, it, particularly here in, in, in Michigan. Um, but relative humidity matters. Um, we typically only talk about it when we're you know talking about you know what's going on outside, what's the heat index. Um, but it matters in spaces and it matters to the way our bodies function in spaces. Um, our health depends on a proper balance of, of water, both inside and out. Um, for example, when the humidity is too low, or the mucous membranes in our nasal passages, um, they can't effectively uh, humidify and filter out particles from the air that we breathe, right? Then they allow those particles to, um, to, to, to travel deeper into our lungs, which can cause problems, right? So we want to make sure that we've got proper humidity in our spaces as well. And this slide talks a little bit about that. And interesting to note, the humidity, uh, the relative humidity range that's ideal for humans is the opposite for pathogens, right? So we like for it to be between really ideally between 40 and 60 percent. Um, we, we have a little fudge factor here in Michigan because it's really dry in the winter time, so we, we take it down to 30. Um, but um, pathogens don't like that range. They prefer to be outside of it. They, they prefer to be less than 20 or more than more than 65 uh, percent relative humidity. Um, so, but regardless of what kind of technology you bring into the space, there are there have been numerous studies that um, that demonstrate the value that commissioning plays on overall project quality, um, both for new and existing buildings. Um, and I know a lot of projects tend to say, "Oh, we we can't afford commissioning," but you can't afford to not commission your projects. Commissioning is that quality assurance process that uh, makes sure that the selected equipment is going to meet your needs, that what's delivered to the job site is correct and complete, um, that it's installed properly, that it's functioning properly, and very importantly, that your in-house staff have been trained on how the equipment should be operated and maintained, including any safety protocols and procedures that they should be following, and that they have complete reference documentation to refer to for record keeping, for refresher training, 
and for training of new employees, right? When folks come into the facility, they don't know how things are supposed to be working. Your, do your documentation, your building system library houses all of the information that tells them that. And having a good quality commissioning process makes sure that all that stuff is in place, so which uh, dovetails very nicely into your maintenance program, which you can see on the next slide. So one of the things that, um, that, that Regina and, and Stuart both mentioned um, was um, that often uh, one of the big problems in schools is deferred maintenance, right? Uh, which is really kind of a nice way of saying that broken things remain broken. Uh, but we know that the sole purpose of the HVAC equipment is to provide good indoor environment uh, that supports student learning. Right. So this HVAC equipment can only do its job if all of its parts work, right? Um, the, the most common unmaintained components in the HVA system are the actuators and the sensors, particularly those on economizers that control the amount of outdoor air um, that's brought into the building, right? And this is one of the key components. Outdoor air is one of the key components of indoor air quality. All right, so we want to do our level best to make sure that we eliminate deferred maintenance. And we can do that, as we can see on the next slide, by starting with a good maintenance program that's tied to enterprise objectives and championed by executive level management who expect and demand to see regular performance reporting with KPIs that connect to the goals and objectives. For example, we know that outdoor air ventilation rates impact student performance. So what are the average in, uh, ventilation rates in each classroom? Are they supposed to be high performance? Are they supposed to be meeting high performance standards? Do they even meet minimum standards, right? As Stuart mentioned earlier, many of them do not, right? But data um, from a solid maintenance program will help schools answer those questions real time, right? And one of the, one of the other key components to a facility own and plan is staff training. I cannot stress enough the importance of regular ongoing training for Owen and staff um, with the goals for energy performance and IAQ that we have currently um, across the country. We're asking a lot of our buildings. They're becoming a lot more complex. We've got integrated controls um, for multiple equipment by various manufacturers, data tracking, remote operations, diagnostics, information modeling. Um, state of technology is ever advancing. State of building technology is ever advancing. And the knowledge and skills and competencies of our facility O&M staff need to also be ever advancing. The HVAC system cannot do its job of providing a quality indoor environment that supports student learning if the personnel tasked with its upkeep don't know how to identify problems don't know how to repair problems, and don't understand how the HVAC system or even their own role impacts the whole school operation. Um, so training should be provided um, not just for O&M staff, but for principals and other administrators, for teachers and uh, even students. Um, of course, not everybody needs to know how to change the filters, um, but training should be commensurate with the person's role within the organization, right? Um, so, for example, students don't need to know how to, to operate uh, the chiller, but they, it would be helpful for them to know that it's not a good idea to leave crayons on the radiator. Or it may be helpful for teachers to understand that their desks shouldn't block airflow from ventilators um, or where and how they should place in-room air cleaners. Um, and so some of the things here with, I'm just going to briefly, um, you know, talk a little bit about um, the filter issues, um, some of the things that I've seen. In, in some of the assessments that I've done through um, across the state in schools and in, in other buildings as well. You know, filters have a direction. Um, if, 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 the, if the maintenance tech doesn't understand this, they may install the filters backwards and then the, you, you get reduced filter performance. Um, the filters are designed for airflow through them in a particular direction. Um, again, one of the, one of the things that's, all, that's usually broken in, a, in the facility is the filter gauge. So how do you know when you need to replace the filter? Are you replacing it on a schedule? Most cases not. Um, so if you don't have that, that filter gauge to tell you when it's time to replace it, you, very often um, replacements happen much too late. And then, you know, sometimes people have, uh, they're, they're well-meaning, but they just um, go over a little bit. So for example, uh, are the, the filters installed in the correct direction, right? The bags should be oriented vertically, not horizontally. Um, if you do, orient them horizontally, you will end up with um, possibly reduced airflow and um, higher pressure drop. 
Um, very briefly, I wanna just talk about the building system library. Every building needs to have one. Um, you need to, we, we should have as built documents for our facilities that talk about how they operate, how they're intended to operate, um, and wh what the set points are, um, what the proper protocols and procedures are for startup and shutdown. And I, I'm going to rush through this because I've got just a couple minutes here. Next slide, I want to just talk a little bit about um, some of the documentation that is that is available to assist folks that are looking to um, improve their building performance and their indoor air quality. Um, there are standards for everything, pretty much everything that we need to do with related to to a building, from um, from from the design of the the building and how it operates to the maintenance of the building to the commissioning of the systems for the building. Um, there's a number of of um, resources here from ASHRAE. And I just want to end on this note and say that very often we think about how um, th that there's a conflict between indoor air quality and energy efficiency. There is not. Um, and so we can see here in some of the, the, the documents that ASHRAE has, we, we, we have uh, energy standards, but we also have advanced design standards. Um, for energy efficiency and facilities as well. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Renji to talk about um, more about balancing that energy efficiency in buildings. We have Renji Chan. Hi, Renji. Go ahead and uh, go ahead and start. Renji's sure, with um, DOE, our sister agency. Sure. Thank you for having me today. Um, I know we're running short of time, so I'm going to go fast. Um, I'm a research scientist at Berkeley Lab, leading the Efficient and Healthy School campaign. Uh, for the Department of Energy, and we've been hearing about the, these energy concerns. The campaign is here to help. We're here to provide technical assistance to look at approaches that can improve both um, energy performance and indoor air quality. We're really lucky to have EPA and Department of um, Education as partners. Just really grateful to learn from their deep experience in working with schools. So today we've heard many approach, approaches that schools are considering to improve ventilation, filtration, and air cleaning. And we recognize that some of these measures will increase energy use, but note that there are strategies to lower your overall HVAC energy use. Um, there's some relatively simple things you can do, um, making sure things work, like Sonia was saying, um, the commissioning, making sure your air dampers work, do air duct ceilings, install advanced uh, controls such as economizer, and make sure that that economizer is working. So all those are relatively simple. And as you think about the greater energy saving. That you, that you can achieve from replacing your system. There's where some of the resources that the Department of Energy on the low carbon technology strategy toolkits can help um, give you some guidance and good technologies to consider. If you are retrofitting, replacing your system, we're really encouraging your schools to use the integrated system approach. So first, start with the high efficiency equipment. Be really explicit in your performance specification of what um, efficiency equipment that standards that you want to hit and then layer on top of measures that you can that can get you further. For example, you will want to replace your existing Sono level um, thermostat with a networked system and better if you can include your CO2 monitoring, better if you can do uh, th those filter um, uh, rack designs that Sono was showing you so you can achieve high efficiency, low pressure drop air filtration. And if you even think of bigger to go beyond HVAC and look at all the other um, synergies that you can get from doing retrofits on your building um, technologies. So if you're thinking about lighting, if you're thinking about um, air uh, energy analytics, the Department of Energy has the Better Buildings Toolkit. Really encouraging all of you to go check it out so that you can you know, think through more holistically, how can I really get at those good energy saving as I improve indoor air quality. So Tracy already mentioned the um, American Rescue Plan funding and the Department of Energy is also launching their 500 million grant program through their bipartisan infrastructure law to make public school more energy efficient. And the programs really aims to lower energy costs, improve indoor air quality and prioritize schools that are most in need. So I really encourage you to join the campaign. We're here to help whether you're interested in direct technical assistance, recognition opportunity, I just want to learn more about um, the, all the opportunities and resources that the Department of Energy has offered. Uh, please sign up and be to help. Thank you. All right, so we've now uh, reached the part of the webinar where we'll be hearing 
more from folks that are on the ground in the school district. So first up, we have Dr. Don Ball, the Director of Operations and Transportation for the South Lake School District in Michigan. Go ahead, Don. As always, I'm Don Ball, I'm Director of Operations for South Lake Schools. I have 26 years experience in schools with indoor air quality. Uh, okay, right now, the model that we follow is the EPA's uh, IAQ Tools for Schools program. We, we have a teacher who has an issue with indoor air quality in their classroom. We have them complete in the indoor air quality complaint form. We review the concerns. If we determine there is a problem, we have a third party consultant review the form and conduct testing in the room while it's occupied. We then review the test results and make appropriate changes to the classroom. Our indoor air quality goals are to identify any obvious existing indoor air quality pro problems, provide an intra-district comparison of buildings and a logical approach to managing indoor air environmental quality while within each of the buildings. We generate a report of the baseline survey using industry accepted standards for sampling and measurement so that future levels of indoor air pollutants may be compared to this reference point in time, and then provide assistance in developing a plan to remediate significant indoor air quality problems. Um, our indoor air quality testing is for carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, temperature and relative humidity. We do fungal air testing in areas having uh, had moisture humidity problems, visual water staining, visual mold growth, musty odors, or occupant complaints regarding the allergic reactions that they may be having. We also inspect mechanical and ventilation systems on a random basis to determine the general condition of the system and include maintenance conditions, mechanical conditions, as well as operational conditions. The review of the report, we review the report and we develop our maintenance and future planning for the district buildings using that report. We do this on an annual basis for all the buildings in the district. So we have a baseline moving forward to see what needs to be changed on a, on a yearly basis and make sure that our preventive maintenance programs are in good shape. So why do we do it? Our testing ensures that our HVA systems are operating appropriately. It provides an operating baseline for our systems and is shared with the building staff and answer any questions that they may have. Now I'm gonna hand you off to one of my colleagues. I believe Peter's up from Flint Public Schools. Good afternoon, my name is Peter Medor with Flint Community School District. I've uh, been affiliated now with Flint Schools for over eight years. Uh, first, uh, they utilized me as a uh, maintenance supervisor. So I got very familiar with the, uh, the, the facilities and the buildings. And uh, then recently I uh, joined the administration staff as interim director of operations and uh, taking that position, obviously, um, I, I knew what I was getting into. I, I uh, uh, understood all the uh, infrastructure and uh, mechanical and uh, uh, variety of issues that uh, uh, I inherited by uh, coming on with the with the Flint administration. And uh, in the last eight months, I have been. Uh, uh, addressing as many issues as I can. And of course, uh, uh, a few years back when the pandemic started, uh, that was our air quality issue. But if uh, people remember the history of Flint back in 2014, we have a water quality issue. So uh, we've been addressing that as we go along, but now with the COVID uh, putting a hot white spotlight on uh, all air quality, uh, I, I am in my research mode right now, uh, and uh, I have been so blessed uh, to uh, have the EPA come on board and uh, to, to assist me, give me guidance, and uh, hopefully it will evolve into uh, some good positive uh, decision making as we move forward, as we uh, 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 work on our buildings, uh, keep them operational, and uh, to improve them. Uh, to the, the best we can. Uh, this is a picture of uh, my, my new friends at the EPA and uh, with Melissa and Monica, Camden, Jeanette, uh, we went through four different buildings in Flint schools. And uh, I think they got a good idea of what uh, 
what uh, we're in store for as we move forward uh, with making improvements. Um, we're pictured here in front of the Flint Southwestern Academy, which is our high school now. At one time, Flint had four high schools with over 3,000 students in them. And now we have uh, just one high school, one junior high, and nine elementary schools. So the district has uh, shrunk dramatically. We still have 11 buildings and, and roughly 3,000 students. And uh, with our uh, maintenance program, uh, it's, it's pretty modest. And we utilize the School Dude, which is our online work order management system. And with that, uh, uh, the teachers, the uh, secretaries and principals of each one of the buildings, uh, when they uh, come across an issue and identify it, they uh, will submit that into School Dude, which then we uh, will direct, uh, depending on the need, to uh, maintenance or custodial staff uh, to, to address the issue. And uh, the, uh, upon uh, the uh, onset of COVID, uh, Flint, uh, because of the older buildings we have, they're average 66 years old, primarily a hot water or a hot water uh, boilers or steam boiler system, uh, which was running through the, through the buildings into either radiators or into some kind of an air handling system. We really, really have a, a minimum amount of airflow and uh, more importantly, uh, air exchange. And they, uh, my predecessor uh, went uh, and did uh, apparently some research, probably not enough uh, according to what some of the experts have told me, but uh, they went with the iTech ION stat which is just a very small wall-mounted unit. Uh, and as I found out, as uh, uh, I looked into it further, uh, that it does have uh, emits in ozone and um, in uh, some type of a, a peroxide, which uh, I have been told by not just the EPA, but anybody else that understands uh, indoor air quality, that that's not a good recipe, especially with students with asthma and other uh, respiratory uh, issues. So I have, uh, since realizing that, have been in that, again, research mode, and I've heard uh, many, uh, many ideas and uh, uh, recommendations. I've looked at uh, what most people consider the basic uh, plug-in type of air uh, purifier in, uh, in the buildings with the Honeywell, I guess, because of the brand name and uh, with the uh, smaller rooms that we have. Uh, they, some people feel that that is an alternative to uh, at least addressing uh, and trying to improve the air quality as much as we can. Um, the uh, schools themselves, uh, we have a, a contractor that changes our air filters for us, and they have moved up to a MERV 10 as far as the uh, the quality of the of the filter, which still allows uh, adequate airflow and uh, uh, provides uh, adequate uh, filtering. And I, uh, I have urged them to move it from uh, four months as far as uh, the filter change to three months. And uh, based on the information I've gotten from several of the Zoom meetings that I've been involved with, uh, uh, I realize that the higher the, the number is, uh, is key, especially with the air purifiers, which is uh, one of the items I will be uh, looking at when we do purchase ours. But uh, when you look at the old antiquated air systems that we do have, um, the MERV 10 is uh, is what the school has uh, decided to go with, at least in the interim. That's what our uh, contractor is using. The um, I'm really looking forward to um, the assessment that is being done by the EPA. And uh, I do want to uh, not only utilize that document, but uh, also to, uh, move forward with some indoor air, uh, indoor air quality testing uh, to determine um, to what level we have to bring our standards up. And um, uh, with these older buildings, like I said, 66 years old, uh, we have many, many challenges. These uh, buildings have uh, bad, uh, very poor uh, uh, designed and uh, maintained uh, roofs. Uh, many of them are almost all of them are leaking, so we got to address those issues, uh, which obviously affect the air quality. But uh, 
uh, we also need to uh, to uh, purchase uh, 250 uh, air purifiers here within the next month or so to uh, to uh, change out the uh, the iTech ion stats that we uh, currently have and uh, uh, to uh, hopefully when the kids come back uh, to school in August, uh, I think it's August 2nd, that we'll be ready for them. Uh, hopefully uh, pandemic will be quieted down and we won't have such, uh, such a big issue as we had in the recent past. But uh, lastly, the, um, I wanna be able to utilize whatever funding is available. Uh, which is a big part of, of why I'm involved here with this uh, with this uh, discussion, and of course uh, Flint uh, has the ESSER funds and the ARPA funds, which um, will be it will become valuable. The the challenge there is um, trying to retrofit uh, HVAC systems and and other uh, air quality improving systems into these older buildings because they are uh, so antiquated and uh, basically wore out that it's uh, it's going to be a challenge for any contractor to be able to uh, retrofit their equipment uh, to any of these buildings. So having said all that, uh, it is a, a real privilege to work for Flint Community Schools. I have been here, like I said, for eight years, and uh, it is really a privilege to work with this group uh, within earshot of me right now because uh, I'm in that uh, research learning mode, and I just want to make sure we uh, utilize uh, our decision making to the best of our ability and utilize all the funding that is available to the best of our ability so uh, i'll sign off with that i want to thanks uh, thanks again for all the great information you're providing me have a good day okay next everyone. One. Gonna... go ahead mike go ahead, go ahead. All right. i'm going to try to make this as brief as possible so good afternoon my name is mike flowers i'm the environmental health and safety uh, inspector with Detroit Public Schools Community District. So just a brief background, the, the district manages over 12 million square, square feet of enclosed building space. That equates to 106 buildings, seven administrative facility buildings and two bus terminals. And our average uh, age of our buildings range from nine to 125 years old. On the bottom slide here, it just shows the different types of ventilation systems that the district utilizes. All right, well, what's going well in Detroit? So we conducted uh, HVAC assessments uh, back in 2020 up until 21. Through that assessment, uh, we found 88% of our buildings could increase central air filtration through the use of higher rated MER filters. Uh, 34 schools needed immediate ventilation system repairs. And uh, the department or district developed a plan with uh, priorities to upgrade uh, these buildings with federal funds that were becoming available. So our indoor air quality assessment results showed um, 89 percent of our interior readings were within ASHRAE recommendations for thermal that's temperature 98 were below ASHRAE standards for relative humidity 100 percent of our buildings were below OSHA standards for CO2 and 100 percent were below OSHA standards for CO for carbon monoxide so with that being said we conducted a second indoor uh, air quality assessment and an assessment of our HVAC equipment on those 34 buildings that needed uh, immediate repairs back in our uh, previous assessment in uh, 2021. So with that being said, we conducted assessments in 24 of those 34 buildings. Uh, a total of 321 interior readings were collected and 100% of the readings were within ASHRAE standards for temperature, 97 were within or below ASHRAE standards for relative humidity, and we achieved 100% on both uh, CO2 and CO, um, with those readings. So the 97%, we had one school that had some issues with some coils. Those have since been repaired. So um, hopefully when we get these tested again, we'll achieve 100% for all uh, of those ratings. So our ongoing challenges. So uh, with that, you know, the district, we look at providing supplemental air purifiers for all of our classrooms and office spaces. And so we did an early analysis of several uh, air purifiers that vendors had provided to us. So um, the chart or the slide next to it shows the relative size of particles. And I think this was mentioned by Stuart and some others earlier. So we were looking at what do, are we trying to filter out? So we know that the COVID uh, particle ranges anywhere from 0.06 microns to 1.4 microns. So we were looking at 
supplemental air purifiers that could filter down to 0.1. And those were the uh, supplemental pur purifiers that had HEPA-13 filters. So there's a difference between true HEPA and, and uh, HEPA-13. So true HEPA, for example, would only go down to 0.3 microns, whereas HEPA-13s will go down to 0.1 microns. So we wanted to be able to capture, you know, uh, not necessarily the smallest COVID particle, but, you know, the mid range to the large COVID particle size. So that's why we selected uh, air purifiers that could, could achieve those goals for us. Also, uh, and, and then we started providing supplemental air purifiers in June of 21. And then in November of 21, the district supplied larger uh, air purifiers to our cafeterias. And this was um, determined through um, the total cubic footage of each of those cafeterias. So we wanted to right size the adequate number of uh, air purifiers so that we were be achieving, you know, those, uh, you know, filtration rates that we wanted. So our next steps are, will be to continue to evaluate uh, adding additional supplemental air purification units to our gymnasiums, auditoriums, and other areas where you have high student gatherings. And we're also considering installing entire building or upper room UV, UVGI units and mobile UV disinfectant units that are safe and effective and that are uh, free from harmful byproducts such as ozone. And we are also going to continue monitoring our indoor air quality with our environmental consultant. Right now we're doing this on an annual basis and we're also considering uh, utilizing uh, portable uh, IAQ monitors that will measure CO2 uh, particulate matter and other ASHRAE comfort parameters. And as I believe Dr. Uh, Baderman Stewart mentioned, CO2 is a good indicator of if you're achieving your proper uh, air exchanges um, you know, in your classrooms. And then we'll also continue to evaluate uh, those HVAC repairs and just make adjustments based on our recent uh, indoor air quality assessments that were uh, just completed this May. So our challenges, um, you know, for the district is how do we make these indoor air quality improvements uh, sustainable? So after COVID funds run out, we're looking at, you know, increased electrical costs. Uh, there's also going to be, you know, the cost with, uh, you know, changing our MERV filters. Right now, the district, we went from uh, a six month uh, change out of our MERV 13s to now we're doing it uh, 90 days for three months. So, so there's going to be an adequate increase in our cost to, to maintain these items and to operate them. And also the question that I, I would propose to the panel is, you know, how often should we really be conducting these uh, indoor air quality assessments? Again, you know, we're doing it annually now, but prior to COVID, the district would conduct these, uh, you know, on a complaint driven uh, basis. Uh, this is information for me and, and my director, Mike Simmons, Cleveland Simmons, and thank you. Hopefully I got this out here in, in some good time. All right, thanks to everybody for staying with us here. Um, Jeanette. Next up is Jeanette Marrero of my team. Good afternoon. Thanks for our speakers for great information, great presentations. We heard information on planning and assessing two key drivers of our framework for successful indoor air quality management. I want to share information and other resources, Region 5 offerings, and make a request to help you move on a path of further learning and action. In, in this slide, you can see the professional training webinar series is a free ongoing series available online and on demand to view at your convenience. You can complete an evaluation um, and receive a certificate of completion. You can use this as a training program for your staff. EPA has a dedicated website on indoor quality and coronavirus that provides strategies to maintain a healthy school. It includes a Q&A section and is constantly evolving, so please visit often. Here you can see our main indoor air quality schools website where you can find resources such as our mobile app, guidance and energy and indoor air quality, preventive maintenance, and much more. EPA Region 5, as it was mentioned before, has been working and assisting schools for many, many years. This is a list of the offerings that we have for schools. We conduct indoor quality assessments focused on asthma triggers and buildings um, with a modified walkthrough checklist to help identify better ways to manage indoor quality with a focus on asthma and providing recommendations on preventive maintenance practices, low cost, no cost solutions. We just conducted assessments in Flint and would like to do more in Michigan. 
We conduct training, train the trainer trainings on different indoor quality topics, radon, mold, asthma triggers, and these could be customized for the different school audiences, school nurses, teachers, facilities, and others. We also have our air sensors loan program where individuals can borrow our sensors for up to a month and use them in different projects. We can help you create an indoor quality management plan, working with you on key drivers and technical solutions. We don't do this alone. We have a one health approach where we can work in region five with other staff working on school related programs. These are some of the programs that we have for outdoor air, the flag program where flag is raised based on the air quality index to inform the community at large, clean school buses that provide funding to retrofit and purchase fuel efficient buses and best practices for near road schools. As you can see, some of these, even though they're outdoor, it can have an impact on indoor. There are other environmental health um, resources addressing different topics, such as integrated pest management, drinking water, lead, and energy. The sensible steps documents that you can see in the picture in the slide has a checklist that was recently updated and could be filled in electronically that address these topics. Please check it out. Our environmental education resources include student awards, grants for projects, lessons, plans and lots of information for students. As you can see, there are many, many resources, many topics, and we can help you navigate the many resources to fulfill your needs. You will be receiving a certificate of completion for attending today's webinar. My final request is for you to fill out the evaluation form to help us better serve and support your needs. We created a questionnaire that will help you assess where you are and take advantage of our Region 5 offerings. We want you to develop a game plan to manage indoor air quality. We want you to use Michigan-based resources and be able to replicate best practices. We want to help you. We want to meet you where you're at, so please complete the form to let us know. Thank you for attending this webinar. This concludes the presentation portion of the webinar. I will invite now my colleague, Tracy Washington Enger, to join us to facilitate the QA session. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Jeanette, and, and thanks to all of our speakers. Um, we had a robust slate of speakers here and, um, and a robust set of information. And before we, we conclude, um, just want to say that many of your questions were actually addressed during the, the, the content of the of the presentations and the webinars, but I do want to invite um, Dr. Pam Pugh to give some uh, some closing remarks for us here. Pam is the Vice President of the Michigan State Board of Education and, um, and such a tremendous champion. So Pam, please. Good afternoon and what a great set of panelists. Um, and I really, am um, happy to hear all of the work that is going forward. And I truly um, and I'm, am appreciative to Mike and Don and Peter who are on the ground making sure that our children um, are safe. But we know uh, that we need real solutions. We need coordinated solutions. We need adequately funded solutions. And we need this type of tech support that the EPA provides. So as mentioned, I am an elected board member to the State Board of Education. Michigan is unique in that we elect um, our members of the board statewide, and we are responsible for uh, leadership and over uh, oversight of uh, schools, uh, um, all schools, public education uh, in the state of Michigan. And some of the things that we've been working on, we learned a lot um, at post the Flint water crisis uh, back in 2017. Uh, we came back as a bipartisan body and we really talked about a comprehensive approach uh, to addressing drinking water. We learned a lot. Um, I think some of the things that came up is that you can provide money, but if you don't have the technical support uh, for that, for those funds to be adequately used, um, then it then it's hard to, to spend the, that funding. So we will be advocating as we started two years ago, uh, the State Board of Education, my uh, some of my board members and I, 
we advocated for ventilation, uh, plumbing, uh, indoor uh, air quality to really be looked at and that there be funding to be provided for that. And we're so happy uh, that the governor did provide funding for that. And uh, we're also advocating for adequate funding uh, to, to carry on, just uh, as I believe it was Mike said, we have to be able to uh, make sure that we have the time to spend this funding. As Regina mentioned, uh, we don't have um, all the parts. Uh, we don't even have um, all of the expertise to be able to do all of the work um, that the funding provides us to do. So we're, we will advocate for um, the adequate time for that funding to be spent. But as um, the governor has put in, in her budget, um, opportunity for additional funding to address uh, some of these issues that we're talking about here today. We will continue to advocate and um, advocate uh, with uh, folks across the state and our legislature to do that. But I just want to thank um, the EPA because we know with your 20 decades of experience, we need to make sure that your voice um, comes across loudly um, and clearly in this space. We know that we have Centers for Disease Control, we have the U.S. Department of Ed, but without the EPA providing that technical support that our school districts need, um, we know uh, that, that that is is necessary for this work to move forward. And uh, what we all want to achieve is for our children and those teachers and educators who who nurture and take care of our children uh, to be safe and healthy in their environments. So I thank you for this opportunity um, and I'll turn it back over to you. And and thank you, Pam, and thanks to all of our speakers. And you know, I, I just, you know, want to reiterate definitely here at the Environmental Protection Agency. And as you have heard throughout this webinar, along with our friends at the Department of Energy who are providing all kinds of on the ground technical assistance to help with uh, indoor air quality improvements and energy efficiency through both the, the um, access to technical subject matter experts as well as grant funding. Um, and so there are links in the chat where you can get more information about that. Um, along with our friends at the um, Department of, of Ed, who are also putting that funding out there and providing that kind of, of support and a CDC. But really, it is our regional staff, our with the partners that you've heard them working with here at ASHRAE and um, at you know, University of Michigan, and you know, and certainly the amazing leading champion school districts who joined us today um, to share their stories and their support and their mentorship. That is what really makes this program continue to work. And so I would just implore you to avail yourself of these partners, of these assets, and of these resources that are available there in Michigan, especially um, our friends at Michigan Eagle who are providing that kind of assessment assistance. And so, you know, one of the questions that we had from Mike Flowers there in Detroit was, how often should we be doing this? Um, how often should we be doing these IAQ assessments? You know, previous to COVID, people were doing them on an ad hoc or ad needed basis. But what have we heard so clearly about the importance of preventative maintenance and proactive activity. If you can build in those annual uh, you know, overall assessments of your facilities, then it will have you poised for the next event that comes up because we know COVID will not be the last airborne challenge that we have in our schools. It wasn't the first and it won't be the last. So as I've been saying, you know, these low these last few months, this is a moment that we have that has come to us by COVID. This moment is turning into a movement because of all of the actions that you are taking within your schools and your school districts, but we can turn it into a monument of improved indoor air quality, improved health and performance for all of our staff and students. Take this moment, this being coming a movement, and let's make it a monument. We can do it. And with the support that you have there in Michigan to do the assessments, do the planning, 
prioritize these uh, these efforts, and Michigan will continue to be the leader that you have always been. So with that, I will again thank all of our speakers. Um, please do fill out the evaluation when you receive it, um, and you will also be receiving a certificate of completion for this webinar um, so that uh, so to show our appreciation to you for being a part of, of this webinar. But, and, and if you can show your appreciation to us by filling out the evaluation, we read them all and we really do act on them. So again, thanks to everyone, and please um, have a great day.